So good afternoon, everyone. We're about to begin our next uh, uh, concurrent session. M Health Tech Innovation. What's here? What's next? Frequently, when you go to these conferences, you see a lot of uh, excitement and lots of enthusiasm about what's coming on in the next next few years. We have here actually a, a panel of uh, developers, entrepreneurs, visionaries, and, and more, most importantly, folks who have actually uh, experienced the the battle scars of implementation development to share with you their insights on really what is, uh, what is likely to happen in the, in the next few years and uh, what they're excited about in terms of uh, mobile health. So I'm going to keep my, uh, I guess, introduction rather brief. We have uh, uh, Jonathan Dreyer from Nuance Communications leading their uh, mobile health uh, solutions uh, re research and, and dissemination. Okay, where we have Brian Gardner from Kaiser Permanente, Pete Hudson from from I Triage, Arthur Lane from uh, Verizon, and Alan Schnell from uh, Saint Vincent's Health, who will talk, share his insights on, you know, the actual implementation of some of these uh, programs. So, we're experiencing a little bit of a difficulty with the room change to try and get the presentations up online. Uh, in the event that we're not able to bring the presentation and visual aids up, uh, I guess the, the presenter will, will have to make do with, uh, with uh, just presenting um, without them. But i um, de delighted to first introduce Arthur Lane from Verizon, who will talk a little bit about his programs initiatives and, most importantly, what he's excited about in the, in, in the near future. So take it away, Arthur. Thanks. I, I appreciate the intro. Uh, my name is Arthur Lane. Uh, I'm the director for mobile healthcare solutions for Verizon. Um, my current focus is is developing products and solutions that focus primarily on the wireless field. When I say that for Verizon, Verizon is not just wireless. Verizon spans the entire ecosystem, it's from wireline to wireless to universal identity services, to cloud-based applications and uh, storage solutions. Verizon really is a, is a multi-channel, multi-vertical company. Um, however, today we're here to talk about mobile healthcare solutions and, and what's on the cutting edge and what's new. And my group actually develops those solutions. So what we're developing right now and what we see that's cutting edge and new is we're seeing really the convergence of all of those assets from wireline to wireless in the cloud. Having the cloud and, and a secure environment enables us to converge those voice, video, text, rich media, all into one experience that help people manage their health and well-being in ways that they haven't been able to do before. Um, when I look out on the horizon and I, and I get excited about things, I get, get excited about technologies that, that will connect the patient and the clinician in a more meaningful way. And what I, what I say and, and mean by that the way that we do care today is, is really kind of the reverse of the way you think it should work. When you get sick uh, or you have a chronic disease, you wait and then you go see a physician. They try to fix you. What we want to do is we want to reverse that paradigm. We want to give people tools and resources to help them prevent the onset of disease, to help them manage their chronic diseases more effectively. And we can do that with technologies that are ubiquitous and that are in the hands of people at all times. And that's why I really get excited just basically about the cool mobile technologies that we have today. And we're just now dipping our finger into the water of what these things can do. From a, a simple smartphone all the way to a, a connected biometric device that you see out on the floor today from companies like Ideal Life and Telcare and Genesis and Zephyr and Airstrip. Those technologies are on the cutting edge and they're actually here today and you can actually use them. However, when I look out onto the future, what are some of the barriers that are, that are in our way for adoption? The way that I, I look at that field, you know, there's a lot of things that are in our way. The biggest kind of you know, first hurdle is always a regulatory hurdle. Um, so when you bring some of these products and services to market, you need to make sure that they're safe and secure. So one of the hurdles you have to jump through is HIPAA, of course, and to make sure that, that your, uh, all of your solutions are in compliance with HIPAA. Um, the second one that, that we look at that, that prevents us from really gaining that, that, that entry into market quickly and getting to the cutting edge is the FDA. You need to make sure that your, your devices and applications are safe and they're effective. They actually do what they say they're going to do. Um, those are barriers that, that make it hard for small, agile companies to really bring to market quickly um, their solutions. 
At Verizon, um, what we can do is we can help those smaller companies and enable them to get through some of those, those areas. We have services that we've rolled out to help people with HIPAA. We have services in the cloud that are compliant with regulations. The solutions that we're working on, which I'll talk about in a second, are uh, both compliant with HIPAA and in compliance with the FDA. Um, we're working on right now, we have a live submission into the FDA for the first solution that we'll be rolling out, which is called Converse Health Management. I can't really promote it here today because we do have a live solution, but I can tell you about the features and functionality of it. Converged health management, it really is what it says. It's converging traditional care management assets with cloud-based and wireless assets to create a ubiquitous, far-reaching care management platform that allows a person to connect with their clinician and have an effective engagement to manage their health and well-being focusing in on chronic diseases as well as well, health and wellness to have the whole continuum of care. The second solution that we're working on that actually is, is here and now today that we'll be uh, launching in the next uh, two quarters is called virtual visits. It's taking the combination of using wireless internet technology and other biometric devices to be able to have a minute clinic-like experience in the palm of your hand so that you can receive care anywhere at any time via a mobile device. Why have we chosen the mobile device? Because it's ubiquitous. When we go to bed at night, we no longer have alarm clocks. We use our mobile device. When I go to the bank, I don't enter the bank anymore. I use my mobile device to do most of my banking. I take a picture of my check and I hit deposit. I move money from one account to the other. We want to take the same experience and the same uh, technologies that are used there and leverage those into healthcare. We haven't been able to do that in the past because we didn't have scale and we didn't have security and we didn't have safety to do it. Um, we're at that point now where we can do that. So I, I think I've answered the first question off the bat. So I'll turn it over to the next speaker. All right. Did we get the slides working? No? It's a tech session. We don't have slides. Oh, wait, I got a nod. Hold on. So as they're, as they're bringing this up, so my name is Jonathan Dreyer. I'm the Director of Mobile Solutions Marketing at Nuance Healthcare, or Nuance. Um, many of you, actually, how many know of Nuance out there? All right. That's pretty good. And those of you that don't know of us, you probably do know of us or you use us, but you're not really familiar with it. So we um, essentially are a, uh, have been known for years as a speech recognition company, but we do much more beyond just speech recognition. Um, healthcare is one of the largest segments of our business. We also do enterprise uh, area, uh, the cars, right, if you use Microsoft Sync or BMWs where you speak to it, that's us. Uh, the Kindle, the voice that talks to you, that's us. Right. Oh, perfect. I got this too. So what I want to talk about is, is specifically within the healthcare space. So I manage our, our cloud-based development platform. So for over a decade now, we have had our speech recognition technology on the desktop. And as more and more clinicians are going mobile, and, and really the focus of what I'm going to talk about here today from an mHealth perspective is really the provider aspect of this rather than the patient aspect of, of accessing a mobile application, so mobile EMRs and those types of documentation solutions. Um, so our development platform allows third-party developers or provider organizations with internal development teams to embed speech recognition as well as what we call clinical language understanding. That's just our term for um, natural language processing or clinical fact extraction to extract and code facts from a uh, physician's dictation. So to talk about um, what's here and what's next, there's a, there's a couple things that I think are really important to cover. Um, some of the challenges that we face today are, are really around data input and data retrieval. So there are a number of applications that have been released in the market over the last two, three years, really, I mean, the prevalence of those apps that are available on these mobile devices, whether they be native applications or um, browser-based applications that run on these mobile devices, they've really grown significantly and they've shifted in the last year or two from consumption devices, right, information that's being presented to the physician or caregiver um, at some point in the care cycle, and now they're being uh, expanded on to include data entry, right, documentation, as well as further data retrieval, and I'll talk about some of those challenges that are faced on the, uh, the uh, on-screen keyboards and the, the lack of some of the input devices. Um, I'll then kind of transition into experience enhancing technology, so layers of application that you can uh, embed into or add on top of an application to really improve the usability. Where we are today from a two-minute viewpoint of, of, of mHealth applications today, and then also where these, these applications and the technology from a mobile health perspective, again, from a provider focus, um, where that's headed. 
So one thing's for sure, I don't think anyone would disagree. Um, we know very well that the usability from a documentation and even a data retrieval standpoint significantly goes down as the size of these devices go. And I probably have more devices than I need. Um, I'm missing my iPad mini, which I haven't received yet. But at any rate, uh, I mean, how many of you guys out there, right, you could do all of your email, you could do some of your basic functions on one of these devices, yet you probably don't, right? You still go back to the desktop. Um, I think a lot of that's changing. Um, speech recognition, we obviously feel, is a very strong component of that. Something Arthur mentioned, and we'll talk about this in just a second, is really um, uh, the, the consumer aspect of this, right? Remembering that the physicians are also consumers. They use these devices in their everyday lives. So trying to transition those experiences that you have in your consumer day-to-day -day life to your clinical workflow, I think it's really an important aspect of this that we'll talk about. Um, some other challenges here, too. Um, this is actually a stat that I think is wildly off because I don't, I don't think I know how many people type even 40 words a minute. It's probably about half of that. Um, these are actually statistics from, from research over the years that we've done. And this is actually based on a, on a desktop. Granted, I have done the YouTube search and found the, the kid across seas that can type 80 words a minute into one of these devices. But I think the bulk of the population is probably somewhere in the 20 to 30 word a minute typing. Um, again, significantly reduced here. The main real Achilles heel for usability and adoption of these devices in a, in a clinical setting from a physician provider standpoint um, is really significantly uh, hindered by the typing and the, the, uh, the peck and hunt of these devices. So. If we look at, at different solutions that are available on the marketplace today, things that are coming um, into play, you know, the, the ability to do speech-to-text recognition on these devices is huge, um, offsetting the power from the devices themselves. Um, you're going to see this actually in the market today. We have about 350 developers that have joined our program in the last year and a half, uh, about four dozen commercial apps out there, anywhere from the large players like Epics and Cerner's um, and their mobile applications, their iPad, iPhone applications, down to specialty point-of-care documentation solutions. So we have a number of, of partners and developers that we work with in the dermatology space, um, chiropractic, orthopedics, veterinary. Um, you name it, the list kind of goes on and on. And it's not just documentation solutions that are out there that are, are benefiting from these, again, quote-unquote experience-enhancing technologies. Um, you also have search tools, right, clinical content search tools, and other um, pieces of technology, communication apps that are getting embedded into these workflows. So you look at this, right, the integrated assistant, something that we've all seen, right, grow over the last year from a consumer perspective. We're going to start to see more and more of these assistants come into play, whereas you go to a screen real estate of three and a half, four inches, being able to retrieve information with voice to say, you know, what are the patient's vitals, or what's my schedule, or when was their last appointment, schedule a follow-up, order this medication. Being able to do that all with voice and provide that natural interaction, really reinventing and simplifying the clinician's relationship with the technology, um, removing some of those barriers, making it a natural interaction for both entry and access of information, I think we're going to start to see that rise. You also then look at um, integrating, this goes back to Arthur's point too about the consumer aspect of this, right? Swipes, like what we do is we allow a user to swipe their text, right? Delete by swiping your finger and you can keep deleting text with your finger swipe. So being able to, to control every aspect of the mobile application um, from both the documentation and also a navigation standpoint. When we look at this today, um, you know, from a real high level, there are apps across all these categories. So you have apps that are all different types of documentation solutions, access to resources, clinical trials, pharma, disease management, patient communications. I mean, we see these out there in the exhibit hall. And you have these across all different types of specialties. And I think each of these different areas have done a really great job, respectfully, in the last couple of years of, of getting to those really specific tasks that a user may want to, uh, um, uh, how they want to interact with the devices and with these applications. But that's really the, the, the where we are today, right? Just that, that interface into what was once probably a desktop solution, new workflows that are created from both the provider and patient standpoint, and then how do we go beyond this? <clears throat> so this is where, I'll close with this, is marrying up the technology, right, those, those different experience-enhancing technologies, technologies that can layer on top of what's in the market today. Um, being able to do these things, and actually some of these things are you'll see in, in live implementations of, of these mobile products today, these questions and answers, right? I already mentioned some of these. What's my schedule today? Right? What are the patient's vitals? When was the patient's last appointment? Uh, what's the vaccine schedule for children? And then you start to get to more directed actions, like show me my next patient's records, schedule a follow-up for next Monday, uh, order a prescription X for this patient. And then that continues to go further and further, where you start to have more 
meaning and intent understanding from these applications. So, you know, a lot of the, the integrated assistants or digital helpers of today are, are somewhat um, limited in that you ask them to do something and they do it. Now we have the technology available to actually harness and hold the conversation with these devices and hold the context of that conversation like you're actually talking to a human. So, you know, you can see up on screen there that conversational interaction for scheduling a, a, a follow-up. The app may tell you when there's availability, right? There might be a couple time slots on Friday. You say, give me the first one in the morning, like you would say to a human. So being able to, again, break down those barriers. Or, again, further, discerning complex intents. So, you know, are there any interactions between A and B? Taking the data that already exists in these applications, layering it with that type of, of complex intent understanding and those types of interactions. And I think it's safe to say we're going to really see some exciting things happen especially here in the, in the uh, M Health space, and I'm sure our friends at the provider organizations will, will hopefully share that same uh, vision and hope for what's to come. So that is that. Thanks. Yeah. Next slides. Can we bring up the slides for Dr. Alan Schnell at St. Vincent's Health? Okay. Uh, well, good afternoon. Welcome. There we go. Thank you. Uh, Alan Snell, and I'm with uh, St. Vincent Health. I serve as the CMIO, Chief Medical Informatics Officer. I've been there five and a half years. Uh, I am a primary care physician, practice uh, 20 plus years in northern Indiana. Go Irish. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> had to get that in. Sorry, Will. And. Um, and then came to St. Vincent as their first CMIO. Had a distinct pleasure working with Ascension Health, who's our parent organization, around a lot of innovation and in applying these uh, technologies that our friends have been talking about. So I'm going to show you today some uh, preliminary results of a two-year study that is concluding this month. And it's part of our uh, Beacon grant, which uh, was received in central Indiana by the Indiana Health Information Exchange. Uh, we are a subcontractor for this grant, Indiana Health Information Exchange, many of you are fam very familiar with, very innovative technology organization. I serve on their management board. Uh, they asked me to help them write portions of the grant back in early 2010 because health information exchanges don't deliver care and they needed a, a, a health system like St. Vincent. We're the largest in Indiana with 22 hospitals now. And they wanted to be able to test this across multiple facilities, urban, rural, and suburban areas, and across multiple populations. So we picked the readmission issue because even in early 2010, we knew that October 1st, 2012, would be here before we knew it, correct? So we knew the readmission penalties were looming, and we knew that we had to do a better job figuring out how we were going to address that, and of course we chose the mobile technology platform to do that. So we went about the process once the grant was awarded of establishing a clinical trial. I received IRB approval for both St. Vincent and Indiana University. Uh, we uh, received the participation of seven of our 20 hospitals at that time in the St. Vincent system, and then seven hospitals that were not associated with St. Vincent because we didn't want it to be only within our organization. So we had 14 hospitals all together. Uh, we targeted CHF, congestive heart failure, and chronic lung disease, uh, COPD, because those are the two most common diagnoses with the highest readmission rates. And those that we knew were going to be targeted by CMS, and of course now CHF is one of those that won't be reimbursed within 30 days uh, if it's readmitted. And uh, <clears throat> we wanted to test not only the technology and the latest mobile platform and using video conferencing. Now, that was interesting, just a side note. At that time, mid-2010, when we went out to the market and asked for a mobile platform with software and with video conferencing capability into the home, that narrowed our choices significantly. It took about 75, 80 percent of the vendors out of the, out of the race at that time. So we, uh, we did a selection process with uh, Ascension Health's uh, innovation and technology evaluation uh, group uh, that I work closely with. And uh, we also then uh, 
obtain the services of the survey patient activation measure. How many have heard of that? University of Oregon, Dr. Judy Hibbert. It's a great tool. If you haven't heard of it, please look it up. Patient activation measure, the PAM survey. It's not an SF12, SF, uh, SF36 type of patient satisfaction. What it really does is it measures the patient's confidence and their ability to manage their chronic disease. So it was just a perfect fit for this type of study. And we randomized then patients beginning in late 2010. Uh, we started in December and <clears throat> set up a nurse contact center. And we began with using this device, and I'll show you a couple more pictures. But it allowed for the video conferencing, the vital signs, as you can see, daily weights, daily blood pressure, and um, pulse oximeter when indicated. But in addition to the vital signs, and this is where we distinguished from other studies published in the literature at that time, is we really wanted to see what is the impact of being able to deliver educational material into the home and assigning patients educational uh, videos and questions. That, so daily they would answer six questions and we created a decision support around that and alerts. So if the patients were feeling more fatigued or more short of breath, this branching tree logic is all contained within the device and that would alert our nurses to call them back. And here's another picture uh, provided by the vendor of the device. It's called the CLAM. It's the health guide. Uh, which is the GE Intel device. And you can see the, the video conferencing. Now, the first thing we did when we, we actually hired a company out of Ohio that would, when we enrolled the patient and they consented, and then we randomized them. So the patient didn't know, the nurses on the hospital units didn't know, the physicians didn't know whether they would be in the trial or not. Then, the, then these devices were set up in the home within 24 hours. The first thing we did was turn it on, introduce the nurse, and do medication reconciliation. Now, you can imagine all of the mistakes and confusion and errors that we picked up, which is really quite revealing, because patients being hustled out of the hospital in you know, the short three, four day length of stay, they just don't get it, they don't understand, and we pushed them out the door very quickly. So the nurse took time and would actually have the patient or the family member hold their pill bottles up to the little camera you see at the top of the device and could read the prescription for them and help them understand what the generic name meant versus the brand name, et cetera. And that's where you can really do powerful medication reconciliation in the home. So this kind of summarizes what I just uh, mentioned uh, <clears throat> and the graphics that we use to uh, help others understand what we're trying to do. And here are the preliminary results through the end of October. We enrolled uh, approximately 200 patients now. I'm sorry, over 200 patients now. And you can see uh, you have the usual drops and you have the difficult to uh, follow up patients. And we're going to use the health information exchange, by the way, at the end of the trial. We'll give them the patients' names and the control group that we that were lost to follow up because only the health information exchange, and we have very robust HIE in Indiana, they know if the patient was readmitted within the 30 days. The hospitals don't know if they go to another facility. So we're gonna harness that. And then you can see also non-randomized patients. So I wanna spend a minute on that. Early this year, 2012, it became obvious that we had enough, uh, actually excess capacity in our devices and in our nursing time. So we made the decision early this year to begin enrolling patients, not randomized, but in uh, case studies. And we went out to our home health agencies and other health ag uh, home health companies, our care management companies, and even to practices. And we said, give us your toughest patients. Give us your sickest, toughest patients. And we were able to identify some of these, of course, through the data that we had on them and the analytics, but some of them we just asked the docs, who, who's in the hospital all the time? And they were able to, they didn't need data, they knew who they were, and that's who we began to enroll. Uh, so with the physician encouragement, because in the trial, the physician really couldn't be involved because we didn't want the bias, but in the non-randomized patients, we used the physician encouragement for the patient, and we're currently over 150 non-randomized patients 
So we hope to end up somewhere just shy of 400 patients, uh, totally monitored, uh, you know, by the end of this uh, month. And here's the results. Intervention group in a randomized trial, 5% 30-day readmission. Control group, 20%, which mirrors the national average. So we're really happy with that. We hope it stays, and we, and we actually will be refining that, all that data in January and February, and then we'll publish this for your review. And then I'll <clears throat> close on an interesting case. So this is one of those 150 case studies that we had. And the reason this case study was so um, dramatic for us is because this patient was covered by our St. Vincent Health Plan. We're self-insured like most large systems are. We have 25,000 employees and dependents. Here's a patient that cost St. Vincent $156,000 last year alone. She's actually had 50-some admissions in four years. She's had everything given to her. CHF clinic, four stints of home health. Home health gave up, said we can't help her anymore. The cardiologist told me that he gave his only patient he ever gave his personal cell number to to call him before she went to the hospital. That didn't work either. So we enrolled her on December 20th. I'm proud to say that she is still being monitored and has had zero admissions now in almost 12 months. And a very bad ejection fraction. She has bad disease, nine chronic conditions. So what's the difference? Well, we're going to publish on that too. And a lot of it is psychosocial and, and uh, uh, lack of resources. And she said to us, I don't understand why they called me non-compliant. You know, I, if I wasn't here, I couldn't be here for when the home health nurse was supposed to come. That didn't really help me. So we met the patient where they were, where they are, in their homes. And she likes that because she didn't have anybody intruding into her home. She sits in front of a device, and the only thing our nurse sees is the wall behind her, and they've developed this real nice bond. And so this patient is very compliant, takes all of her medications, and keeps all of her appointments now. Zero admissions and only one ER visit for in 12 months for an unrelated condition. So where do we go from here? Well, because of the dramatic success of this program, uh, one of the requirements, of course, of uh, the Beacon Grant is you have to have a dissemination plan, which here today we are. So we've given over 50 presentations like this, and we're going to publish. But you also have to have a sustainable business model. So together, St. Vincent and our parent organization, Ascension Health, is actually going to create a joint venture company. And our plans, starting first quarter next year, are to begin monitoring 100% of discharges with the three diagnoses, CHF, pneumonia, QMI, because we won't be reimbursed for those. And we are also going to target the top two, three percent of any given population that are those high cost, the very complex chronic patients, the ones that really rack up the, the cost of care. So we anticipate monitoring on any given day 400 to 500 of those types of patients. So that's that's the direction we're going. The software has greatly improved. The other strategy now we see is not all about the technology. I say that three or four times a week. It's not about the technology. It's about the ability to connect with a patient in their home. So we're now going to devise a, a, a patient education engagement strategy using the mobile health platform and creating a customized care plan for each one of those chronic complex uh, patients with multiple conditions, and then having everyone who touches that patient, including their physician provider, with a health access worker, the nurse that's monitoring, the social worker, everybody will be able to see what that customized care plan is on a device. So that's our strategy moving forward in 2013, and we'll hopefully be able to come back next year and report results of that. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Alan, a very powerful case study there. I'd like to turn it over to another uh, care provider organization. Um, Brian Gardner from Kaiser Permanente will share his perspective on the, the current health landscape. Thank you. Good afternoon. 
Good afternoon. Thanks for being here. Um, I'm Brian Gardner. I'm the uh, leader of the Mobility Center of Excellence within Kaiser Permanente um, Information Technology. Um, my group is essential accountable to, the, to our organization to enable mobile applications and mobile development for um, more than 9 million members, as well as our physician community, as well as our um, over around 180,000 employees. So my group does design, development, testing, implementation, and ongoing product support for mobile applications. So um, this is a really important conference for us, so thank you. Um, we believe that your health happens everywhere, and not just inside of your physician's office or at home, but it happens out and about everywhere that you are. And uh, we also believe that technology, especially mobile technology, will empower and enable individuals to take care and manage their own health. So moving forward, we have a, we've been working with mobile technology um, and have had a strategy since about 2008, 2009, we really started looking at, at mobile access to our website and uh, put together a strategic vision that simply sits um, that healthcare can be expanded beyond our hospitals and beyond our clinics uh, to everyday life through, through, through these digital channels. Um, mobile health definitely takes, um, an op uh, provides an opportunity to personalize your healthcare experience. Obviously, it brings health to you everywhere with the devices that are in your pocket. Uh, it, we b absolutely believe it does improve um, and promotes health, and obviously um, we know that digital engagement with, with our services actually improves and retains our membership growth, so it has a direct connection to membership growth as well. Um, one of the things that we're really starting to look at here is um, care in the future is really going to be sort of uh, four sites of care. Um, whether we like it or not, there's always going to be a need to have um, hospitals and staff beds. Um, there's also going to be a need for, for clinics and, and medical office buildings, uh, visualized there on the left side of the, of the slide. Um, with mobile technology, um, digital health is really starting to expand into your home. And then, of course, there is the, um, the virtual, which is everywhere, which, 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 mobile, mobile, is in, which, excuse me, which mobile is enabling. Um, I think the really important piece about this slide is that technology is a, is a fundamental piece of this. Um, it is enabling um, through, through the um, electronic health met the EHR that we have, the electronic health record that we have in the clinics at the medical buildings, um, we've built off of that um, with regards to our mobile strategy and that technology is what's going to provide that seamless experience between these four sites um, and not necessarily just only enable the virtual piece of it. Um, essential to that is the user experience and that's really what, what our members and patients and even the physicians are going to start to accept and expect is that it's a seamless experience. It's not, you know, your information is, is, at, the, is at the hospital. It's not that, that information that's there is different than what I'm seeing on the phone. So really it's that, it's that seamless experience between these four sites of care. Whoops, too far. So this is a, this is a look back and sort of building on our strengths uh, where we started with an, with an integrated uh, model at a, as a physical, at a physical location, then connected that through the EHR, um, through our Health Connect and our, and our health record. We then built out the digital online presence of, of KP.org, um, uh, and then from there we're then moving into the mobile space. We're, we're essentially building off of, of that same model and then leveraging that in, into the mobile channel. Um, sorry, I lost my place there. This is another, another view of that, of building off that foundation, connected health with the, with the EHR into the interaction model, which we're seeing with, with social, with video, with voice, with um, the internet, and obviously with mobile. Um, one of the things that, that we are looking at is actually redefining that vision. So the, the whole vehicle of healthcare is changing on the left. That is where, where the patients would go to, Arthur, I think, I think you mentioned this as well, you, you don't just get sick and then go to the hospital. It's actually an opportunity to engage with you on a, on a regular basis. Um, moving that into the digital connected care experience, you are able to now access your pharmacy, your, your, um, your doctor, your, your medical record at any point in time. Um, when we first launched our, our uh, mobile products earlier this year, we had gone in, in a two-year period, we'd gone from a 2% um, access from a mobile device in 2009 to our kp.org website to when we launched mobile.kp.org at the, at the beginning of this year, that, that, um, that access was up to 17%. Um, some, some other interesting stats, I just want to throw these out there, is since we've launched that, we've had over 15 million visits to our mobile website as well as our apps. Uh, we have 1.7 million people have looked at their test results online. Uh, over 620,000 people have actually submitted a, an email to their physician uh, from a mobile device, either through a mobile website or through our apps. And we've had over, um, over 350,000 downloads across Android and iOS. So, you know, with, with 9 million members, 17% of traffic, people are really looking to access us um, through the mobile channel. Um, 
redefining that user experience is, is something that is absolutely essential to us. Uh, we take, we take um, everything from the heart of our member. Everything that we do starts with, with our members and our patients, and, and what their experience will, will be like um, is absolutely fundamental to what we do. That's why we have designers on my team as part of our development staff. Um, these technologies and these devices really in, allow for a contextual based experience. So the ability to, I may be going to my pharmacy at one point in time to pick up my prescription. That pharmacy line may be, may be too long. The pharmacy may be closed or maybe a parking structure changed. Being able to alert the member of that and actually taking that mobile context and then moving them into a, a perhaps a different, a different location or a different facility is something that we're actually looking, trying to do. Um, it's, it's all about anytime, anywhere. I, I don't think anybody at this conference doesn't, doesn't already probably think that when they go to bed at night. Um, but it's absolutely something that, that we, are, we are looking at um, on a regular basis. Um, it's in, 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 I'll close on this. Um, it's really about the new normal. So um, for us, you know, it's, it's Arthur, you said this. I mean, I, I don't think I've been to a bank in, in a year. Physically, I mean, I've been to a bank, but I haven't gone inside of a bank to actually do a transaction. Um, I think with, with healthcare, I'm not saying that that, that that won't go away. It's part of our foresight to care strategy that we have. But I, but I really think that um, it's the engagement model that is now the new normal, and our members are, ex are expecting it. Uh, the physicians are expecting it. Um, we have physicians on staff that actually built some of their own apps just to help their lives, make their lives easier. Um, I think what we're, I think Accenture did a study where, where um, 90% of individuals said that they want to use the digital technology to actually engage and manage their health. Um, I know that in that same study, 58% uh, of physicians said that uh, digital health can actually reduce medical errors um, and that they actually leverage it as part of their day-to-day their -day lives. Um, for our members, it's extremely important as well. I actually have, um, this is, oh, I don't have a quote. I thought I had a quote. It must have been on, on the slide that we didn't get in there. We actually have a quote. I'll give it to you downstairs if you come to our booth. Um, we have, um, uh, a new mom actually um, with twins, uh, not twins, with two daughters, um, re regularly uses our application on, 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 a, on a regular basis to either manage their, their appointments or, or contact their physicians or whatnot. And I would say, and she'd said it a lot better than mine, that's why I'm stumbling, but it's not in the, in the deck, but it should be. So apologies for that. But anyways, it's, it's really around um, her ability to just manage her life on the go and not have to stop and make that appointment uh, take the kids away from school or out of daycare, uh, take a day off from work in order to just go and have that very simple, um, healthy transaction um, with, with her doctor. I, I, think, I think that's the thing that's really important is it is a normal experience that people are starting to expect. They expect it in other channels. Uh, healthcare is obviously the one that, that, that makes the most sense for us. Um, here's a quick snapshot of, of what my group has done. Um, we have a number of applications in the store. Some of them are associated with us, and some of them we, we rebranded for internal use. Uh, we have uh, three consumer-based applications that we launched this year. Uh, um, we have a few that are associated with, um, with what we call the HealthWorks program, which is really a, um, an employer-based program that um, in, encourages healthy behavior, um, exercise at work, um, as well as um, team-based um, exercises and competitions for, for employers that offer this, this type of service to their employees. We have another one that's around diet and nutrition. That's the Mix It Up app that, that's up there in the, on the left side. We also have, a, you know, like I said, 180,000 plus employees that, that um, are walking around with iPads now and iPhones, and, and we want them to be able to have more of a virtual workforce and virtual desktop. So we look at certifying those applications as well, things as simple as WebEx and um, and, and, and an email client. Um, internally, uh, for, for physicians, we, we've, uh, we've um, reviewed and have actually piloted some of, the, some of the Epic applications as well. So I'm going to end there. Um, I, I forgot the lower half of the slide. Look ahead. This is the things that we're doing this year. At the end of this year, we have about three applications that we're wrapping up, and into next year, we have probably, I would say, uh, a half a dozen to a dozen more that, that we'll be um, implementing either internally or externally for our members. Um, I do have a this, is a, this is a quick look at our, at our downloads uh, by application. Uh, we're, we're actively involved in, in managing and looking at our, not only our download numbers uh, for, to show engagement, but we absolutely want to look at our ratings. Um, it goes back to that user experience concept that I was talking about earlier. It's all about the member. Their ratings are a way, the ratings of our apps are a way that they can actually give us direct feedback. I'm sure we've all rated apps on our own, and, and hopefully not everybody is only giving bad reviews. Um, but, but we actually do monitor those and actually use that information to provide feedback into our development cycle. Um, 
I do have a video. I'm not going to show it here, but we have a booth downstairs in the 300 aisle. I think it's 324 or something like that. But it actually, it's, it's about a three-minute video, and it gives a nice overview of where we think digital health is going into the future, not only for um, the individual, but also for, for, the, um, for the healthcare community. Um, and, and it's just a nice overview. So if you have time, uh, come on down to, to the booth and check it out. And um, I'd love to talk to you more. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Now I'll turn it over to someone who has lived in, in multiple domains, a physician turned entrepreneur, uh, uh, Pete Hudson, as the CEO and founder of iTriage. Thank you, Will. Wow, this is awesome. Look at all the people here. I was here two years ago, and there were probably uh, three rows of people in the uh, breakout session on consumer engagement. So this is a, a great uh, testament to the growth in the space. Um, I don't know if any of you heard the keynote this morning, but really inspiring uh, keynotes, uh, especially with uh, you know, some of the vision on changing healthcare uh, that, that Mark Bertolini laid out. Um, so I, I'm here to talk to you about iTriage. Um, I'm a uh, old crusty ER doc, um, practiced for about 20 years. And um, uh, my co-founder and I, Dr. Wayne Guerra, um, after practicing for that long, it finally sunk in. Something wasn't working in healthcare, and that was that uh, healthcare, or our patients were not healthcare consumers. They didn't have the information they needed to make better decisions. They didn't know what to think about before they got to the hospital. We rarely had good discussions on a, uh, um, on a, on a medical basis in the ER, sometimes because we were dashing out to see an ambulance, but um, oftentimes uh, because the, the subject matter and knowledge just wasn't there and there was no resource. Um, I experienced the same thing as a, as a uh, caregiver when a family member got sick uh, in the early 2000s, <clears throat> and there was no Wi-Fi in the hospital, and I had to um, uh, bribe the nurses with food to let me go behind the desk, even though I was a doctor, to uh, look stuff up. And so um, I have experienced that, that terror of not knowing um, you know, some of the things you should be worried about in an uh, acute care hospital setting. Um, so as the iPhone came out, Wayne and I felt like this is a profound opportunity to change health care. The fact that you can actually put the information that we walked around with in our head onto a device, um, a, the ability to access broad amounts of data, um, to create a UI that people are engaged with, um, to have the personalization that's on a device with you at all times, um, I think is a profound opportunity, and I hope everybody in here is pursuing that in some way, shape, or form, because um, with this technology, we can make a difference. Um, so iTriage was founded um, and launched about three years ago. Um, uh, about a year ago, we were acquired by Aetna, and so we're definitely a startup with benefits right now, um, <laughs> which is a lot of fun. Um, we are a very innovative, uh, fast-moving company. Uh, we've gone from 30 employees to 100 in the last year and uh, are re uh, attracting a lot of the best talent in the Rocky Mountain region in Denver. Um, before I get into um, talking a little bit about where we are and where we're going, um, I'd like to tell you a story. Um, last April, uh, one of my esteemed colleagues gave a presentation like this to a, a group of uh, insurance brokers and HR benefits people. Um, one of the, uh, the people in the room um, heard, of, you know, heard the presentation, downloaded iTriage, and thought, well, that's cool. I might need that someday. About a month later, she went home and uh, got home late from work. <clears throat> um, her husband was in bed. He wasn't feeling well, and he felt numb on one side of his body. Uh, she went upstairs to talk to him and said, you know, we really need to do something about it. He said, no, I'm going to be fine. I'm going to just go to sleep, and we'll take care of it in the morning. She got out of triage, started looking through it, saw that uh, that numbness could be affiliated with a stroke, um, convinced him by showing him the data, found an ER nearby that was a stroke center through the, the, uh, uh, the database that we offer, brought him there. They got him a clot buster drug, and he's now getting back to normal. And so one data point, one bit of information can save, save somebody's life. So. My uh, plea to you is if you haven't downloaded iTriage, do it now. You might need it in the future. And certainly uh, there's a lot of great technologies out there that can make a difference. 
Um, so when we started, we really wanted to focus on a, a really big healthcare problem, and there's a lot of them. Um, but for us, uh, being in the uh, emergency department space, um, we thought that acute care visits represented a really big problem. Um, inappropriate utilization of care. We saw all sorts of patients that would make decisions to, and go to the urgent care um, for something serious just because of cost, or come to the ER with something that was minor because of um, convenience or, or access. And uh, we feel like that has created a, a significant cost to the system and is also not really a convenient way to access the healthcare system. Uh, very early in the beginning, we realized that if you don't build something that helps what we call the three Ps, and I'd probably add an E on there for employer, um, but if you don't have a, a solution that solves problems for all three Ps, somebody's going to hate you, and it's not going to work out, and your adoption is going to diminish over time. So we wanted to build something that really focused on the, um, the efficiencies that you can create by getting information into consumers' hands and making better decisions, and ultimately that that helps providers who, who provide great quality care, it helps uh, payers who are managing the costs, and it helps patients because they're empowered, they have the information to make better decisions, and they have better outcomes. Uh, so we, we focused very quickly on a couple questions. What, should I, uh, what could I have and where should I go? I better know those two questions. Um, and our vision was really to help people make better decisions all around the world. Um, we, we had a little bit of healthcare experience, and I would argue that anybody uh, um, uh, creating solutions in this space has to have some operating experience in healthcare. It's very complex. There's all sorts of clinical information that, that's required. And so partnering with somebody that, um, that has healthcare background and operating background in, in healthcare is really important. For me, it was uh, partnering with Wayne because he's a lot nicer than I am. Um, we were lucky to have uh, a disruptive technology um, all of a sudden emerge, and in the beginning, I think everyone thought only people with a lot of money are going to own smartphones. That's not the case. Now everybody's going to own a smartphone. So we were very lucky in that, in that sense. And certainly favorable growth trends is, it, some of you I'm sure have seen these curves, um, feature phones diminishing and, uh, and uh, smartphones growing faster than PCs. One of the greatest things about mobile technology is you can iterate quickly. Um, there's great platforms out there, and, and certainly the core platforms on the devices allow you to do many, many different builds, wirelessly transmit those builds, download them. There's all sorts of great platforms for that. I think it's critical for being iterative and innovative in the space, and um, you know that's kind of how we did it. We didn't do power. We didn't do um, um, you know uh, complex applications. We drew pictures, and uh, we did many, many different builds uh, over our. Uh, history here of the last couple of years. So where are we now? Um, I think we're, it, we're coming to a place in mobile health where we're going to see platforms develop, uh, similar to kind of the late 90s with the web. Um, you know, barbecue.com is not going to exist anymore, but Amazon is going great. Um, so I think the ability to do many different things, um, to have uh, uh, broad capabilities for engaging patients and making um, Things that are very difficult to do right now, easier, more navigable, and, uh, and, and, and simpler for patients is important. So we have appointment booking, clinical pathways, and symptom processing, and telehealth content, ER wait times, really kind of a broad, um, a broad uh, 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 set of capabilities. What do I think is going to happen in the future? I think um, technologies are going to have to impact systemic uh, capabilities. So what's the relationship between that ER, the primary care office, and the urgent care down the street? And how do you coordinate that care? And who uses that technology to do so? And, and is it as easy for the, the physician as it is for the, the patient? And are there modules or capabilities for each? I am a firm believer, and I'm sure some, someone here would probably disagree with me, that demand versus paternalistic approach to information is the way that we're going to change our healthcare system. If you keep telling people what to do, I remember what I felt like when my parents told me what to do, and I see what my daughters say when I tell them what to do. <laughs> so if you give people the right information, you make it accessible and understandable, people will learn and then develop knowledge. And that's what we need to, to help change the system. So similar to 
um, you know, going to the librarian, uh, as I did when I was growing up, and, and trying to find out if it was 15.37 or, um, or something else to look up that, that book on the whale. Um, now I can just search for whale on Google. Um, data. Uh, we're, every second somebody opens iTriage to answer a question. Um, we're collecting an enormous amount of data and using big data techniques to analyze that data to uh, come up with, um, with analysis that helps our product get better, that helps our patients and our consumers use the technology better and helps our customers analyze what we're doing is really important. I think anything in the future needs to leverage big data. Um, there is a huge ecosystem out there of established entrenched IT systems in hospitals that really, until the last couple of years, don't play well together. Um, the consumer needs to connect to all of them. It needs to do so in a way that's, uh, that's uniform, uh, that's simple, and that's uh, convenient for patients, or, or we're going to stop this right in its tracks. So we're working with a lot of different HIT systems. Uh, Athena Health, for one, is, uh, uh, has a more disrupt conference every year to bring on partners to integrate with them, all scripts, et cetera, et cetera, uh, as well. Um, so we see really being able to, to um, get back to our original vision of, of providing a technology that helps all three Ps. And by doing so, you know, help payers um, and those at risk for cost on population management um, to help patients make better decisions and start to assimilate some of the knowledge that they need to have um, to uh, um, take care of themselves and to certainly help providers that are uh, providing um, great care, uh, as, as we heard from the Ascension uh, example. Uh, so we've had a lot of luck and a lot of good outcome, but what really matters is the stories like CBS aired last week on uh, the woman saving her husband's life. That's what really matters and keeps us coming back every day, feeling good about what we're doing. So thank you very much. Thank you, Pete. I'd like to open up the discussion for Q&A from the audience. So if you have a question for our panel. And before you do that, can I ask a question of the audience? So as, as Peter said, I've come to this in the past, and I was one of those guys in the first three rows. So can I get a picture of everybody before we ask a question? Smile. All right. Everybody smile. It's Please. not even wide. You can't get wide, though. All right, ready? Use a panoramic. No panoramic, of course. Yeah, I haven't tried that yet, so. All right, thank you. Fantastic. If you have a question, please uh, line up at one of the microphones down the middle aisle. Yeah. But I will ask a very brief question to each of our panelists and I invite you all to interpret it however you like. In, in a very succinct fashion, tell me, what is the innovative spark within your organization? What drives development? What drives innovation? And I, I've heard you know, various themes throughout your, your uh, pieces, core values, with the patient being in the middle, you know, leveraging technology, all these exciting things. But Really, how would you describe it in your own words? And I'll open up to whoever would like to kind of go first. What is the you know, driver of a, a creative thought? Yeah, so the, you know, at Verizon we have a credo, and our, and our credo really drives us for innovation. We're customer facing, we take the customer first. That's the first aspect of it. But really, when I, when I peel it back, there's another nuance that a lot of people don't know of that they will do in the near future. It's something that we call shared success. Uh, one of our goals in healthcare is to push out the innovation that we're doing into the market and share in the success of the development of our innovations and technologies. That's what drives my team right now. Fantastic. All right, I'll go with that too. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's really exciting. Like I said, we have, uh, we have about 450,000 physicians using our technology, so um, a quite sizable piece of the market. Um, working firsthand, I came from the radiology side and about two years ago took on this platform within Nuance and seeing what the development community does, you know, 350 strong in the U.S., about 50, 60 developers outside of the United States, seeing this global perspective of what those individuals are doing, how they're leveraging our technology, but also everyone else's technology, and getting that viewpoint of how they're really enhancing that user experience is, is a fascinating thing that kind of just continues to drive us forward on, on what we're doing. Thank you. Uh, as I mentioned, we're a large health system, not unlike many other large health systems. So we now uh, number 22 hospitals from critical access all the way up to 600 plus bed uh, teaching facilities. 
Nearly 800 employed physicians have done very well, support Ascension very well, and all of that has to change. So innovation for us means we have to change our model. That the model that has served us very well won't serve us well in the future. We have to get the care into the home. We have to have more engaged patients. We have to have team care as opposed to encounter care and sickness care and more em emphasis on prevention. So that's where innovation is going to take us. Uh, Kaiser, um, we like to say innovation is in our DNA. Um, Henry Kaiser and, and Dr. Sidney Garfield came together and sort of created the first health management organization by having Dr. Garfield come down to the shipyards and take care of ship builders during World War II. Um, we continue to um, innovate on a regular basis. We actually have an innovation and in, in advanced technology group uh, dedicated with an IT that um, has its own innovation fund, uh, which we fund internally. Um, we have 180,000 employees that are very, very um, intelligent and have a lot of new ideas, and, and we build off of that. So we, uh, we innovate on a regular basis. Um, we um, engage with our members, as, as Arthur said as well, with his organization. Uh, we, have, we have a member panel that we use for um, digital testing. Um, of, of our products, whether there are mobile apps or a website, consisting of about 30,000 members that have signed up to actually participate in that. Mm -hmm. So we're actively engaged with our, with our own member base as well as our physicians as well. So um, it's part of who we are. Great. Inspiring. Pete? Don't want to spill your water. Uh, we have about 70,000 reviews um, from uh, our over 8 million downloads. And we read, every one of our senior management team reads every review on every platform, every day. So if any of you go home, use this application, and write something tomorrow, I will see it. Um, so write something nice. Um, <laughs> um, so I think that's, that's one thing is, is we put stuff out there. We have five to seven releases every month of our product. So we're constantly iterating and getting stuff out, and then we hear from people. We had uh, you know, a bug a couple months ago, and Everyone saw the one stars coming in like, oh, it's closing down, and we freaked out, absolutely freaked out. Everybody stayed all night, fixed the technology, re-released it. Apple was really cool and got it out in 12 hours. And then actually, it was an Apple problem, so Apple went back, took all the reviews off, and fixed their platform. So um, you have to do things really fast, and you have to listen to your customers. And so we're extremely impatient about anything that impacts that, and, and always will be about your patients, I guess. Thank you. All right. So first question up, please. Okay. Hi. Thanks for an excellent panel. Uh, my question, I think, is most specific to iTriage and Kaiser. And I'm wondering how you're tracking clinical outcomes. I know the case studies are amazing, but on a more macro scale with your 8 million users, are you tracking real bottom line impacts on health outcomes? And if so, how? So one of the things we track is that when um, you are going down a clinical pathway and think that, you know, cellulitis is an issue either, you know, for you or for a family member, whoever you're looking up. Um, we see um, when there's lower cost care added as an option to an emergency department visit, we see a much higher rate of click through to that lower cost care. So people are making decisions based on what's clinically relevant and then what's cost. Um, we, um, we do have an ER check-in product, so our ER check-in product tracks the patient all the way through, and we see a lot of affiliation with the hospital system once they use that to go back, but also to have uh, follow-up procedures and visits and affiliate with that hospital. Um, from a clinical outcome standpoint, um, that is coming, um, and the ability to match claims with member ID and use of technology is something that you know, he has the luxury of doing right now. Uh, we'd like to do with a lot of different payers, um, and I look forward to doing that in the near future. Next question. Yes, uh, excellent panel. Uh, this question here is for uh, Alan from uh, St. Vincent's. Uh, with regards to your intervention uh, group, uh, you had uh, really spectacular results, and you used one example there, a 54-year-old lady. But I would assume that with the CHF and uh, COPD that you had a lot of older patients as well. And I would assume that uh, many of them were not uh, technologically, uh, you know, sophisticated. 
Did you have to use any special procedures with them to get that type of result compared to the younger group? Well, um, it's a, a great question. I didn't go into the detail of this, but the, um, you know, a lot of, a lot of advice was given to us that uh, elderly patients or older patients, senior patients, won't use this technology. We found just the opposite. It was very easy for them to comprehend. The other thing we did is we took the word computer out of all of our literature, including our consent form, and we just substituted the word device. Um, and a lot of them would tell us, I don't know anything about computer. That's all right. We're just going to put this device in front of you. <laughs> and it's touch screen. And, and, and the phrase we use, is, we often say, if you can pump your gas, you can do this. See, they don't know they're even using a computer when they pump their gas. So uh, that's how we got around that. The other thing that's great about mobile, uh, we had tried something, not on this scale, but we had tried a previous project with Best Buy uh, several years ago, and it failed. Best thing about innovation is capitalizing on your failures, right? And that, that uh, failed. It was with diabetic patients. And the reason it failed is because it was used on a PC not Mac and um, analog phone line, but most phone lines are digital now. And the technology was too much for them to overcome, um, plus, plus pricing and other things too. But the technology got in the way. So when you put the device in front of them, you turn it on and the nurse is there, and then they start off. It's just so simple. The other thing about mobile technology versus any other form, it's ubiquitous. So many of these patients don't have computers in their home, but 3G and 4G now is everywhere. So when the technician goes out to install the device, then we, uh, we just have them measure the, uh, the signal strength, and we have different cards, uh, Verizon and those other companies and, uh, <laughs> that I won't mention. And then we just see which has the strongest signal strength for that um, particular home, and then that's, that's the one that goes into the cradle. So it doesn't really take any effort on the part of the, the patient. Uh, it's there. It's, it's always there. It's ubiquitous. And it's easy for them to use. Thank you. Uh, Hi, I'm Sharon Pacciani with the Military Health Care System. Um, what you present is great and really appreciated. A lot of great ideas. But we all have a social responsibility that when we produce such a wonderful products and wonderful ideas, that we address what could go wrong with them and we establish uh, contingency plans, we would say, in the military to either mitigate or eliminate those risks. So along those lines, um, and I ask the panel, what is the one thing that keeps you up at night about what you're doing and how are you working to uh, mitigate those effects? And thank you. I'll make, it I'll make one real quick. So <clears throat> in the development process of, of some of these tools, there is a lot of oversight. Uh, if you have a product that needs to be regulated by the FDA, you have to have a, a, what they call a quality management system in place. And that, that's what helps mitigate exactly what you're thinking. So what keeps me up at night on an FDA certified type of product is that if something would go wrong and someone could actually get harmed, um, it, we, we make it look easy. iTriage makes it look really easy. Um, St. Vincent's makes it look really easy. But all of the work that went behind the scenes to ferret out everything that could go wrong took many, many, many man hours, many man days to do, thousands of them. Um, so we track that, and it just you're tracking everything that could go wrong, and that's what keeps you up at night. Every little instance that something could go wrong, you give someone the wrong message. If you give them the wrong message about a dose of medication, or you made a mistake when you were reviewing their medications, and you had a contraindication that did harm, that's what keeps you up at night. But with quality management systems and the proper systems in place and the proper reviews, the proper oversight at the management level, um, you can ferret out most of those, and this technology is, is, is fairly safe. Last point, we, we always reference banking because it's an easy one to reference. But when you mess up in banking, you can usually reverse the, uh, the, the adverse effect. If you mess up in healthcare, it's really, really hard to reverse. You really can't. Um, I agree. I think the, the mitigating risk, as he said, um, certainly of concern. But really, my concern is uh, big data and how to manage that. Uh, we are creating and will create, because I think the adoption on this is just going to skyrocket. And you can see from my triage and, and the other speakers, 
uh, the, the, the consumers are going to really demand this, and, and that will drive the adoption. We, uh, and I'm telling my organization, we're going to create more data with this platform and this program than we have in our EHR systems, because that's all encounter, episodic encounter-based. This is continual longitudinal care management. So how, how do we begin and what type of analytic tools will we need to manage all that data? And my physician colleagues say, Alan, don't, don't dump all that into my EHR. I don't want all that data. So how do we, how do we begin to manage that in an effective manner and create the triaging and standardized care processes so that the alerts and things like that go to the right people, the escalation process, uh, because we could we can just overwhelm our providers with with data, and that's so that's what I don't know if it keeps me up at night, but it sure makes for a concern. Anyone else? Yeah, I would I would just add to um, the privacy and security is is something that that actually does keep me up at night. The um, the amount of volume that, that we have, and and my fear is that someone logs into the app and it's not their data. So, you know, testing on a regular basis is something that we do. Our test cycle is as is, is long, if not longer, than our development cycle for the apps and, and the digital products that we make. So, um, additionally, the, the identity management of, of on our end back to a, a, a new member when they're registering is a pretty arduous process. Some people look at it and go, wow, registration kind of took about 10, 15 minutes. Why is that? Well, it's, we want to be absolutely certain that you are who you say you are and that when we actually do pull up your record and you engage with it, it's actually yours. So we take that very seriously. Mm -hmm. I'll, say, I'll, I'll add one thing to that. So it's funny because I look at it as, I don't know, the, the technology that can fix the technology is what uh, helps me sleep at night. So, I mean, even on, on your point, I mean, we're, we're doing a lot in the voice biometric space as well. So voice authentication. And this stuff is freakishly, like, scary how accurate this stuff is and how good this stuff can be. So I think I think it needs to be a, a, a you know a way off. I mean we all, you know, collectively from a provider standpoint or from a developer standpoint or or service provider to developers, I think we can do as much as we can, unfortunately. And then it also always comes down to the end users, right? There's there's always that human aspect of it. Until we can get rid of humans, there's going to be some kind of problem at play. So I think it's it's everyone's responsibility collectively from the development standpoint, from the provider, and then from the end user of this technology and the patient. I mean, we're all we're all guilty of having things that are not locked down and having those potentially be taken. And, and if, if someone wants to do harm with it, they can, but, you know, we can do everything we can to, to get in the way. So I think it's probably a, a unified message that, that it's all those privacy things that keep us up. But. Great. We have time for one, one last question. Oh, I'm the last one. Thanks. Mm -hmm. How does uh, preventive health apps fit in with your platform, like weight loss or repetitive stress injury? Was there a specific person you were directing that to, or? I mean, I, I can take a look at that one if it wasn't for me. Um, we actually have that as part of a. We, we've we've tiered our applications into categories. Uh, we have flagship application, which is the application that would be for every single member, uh, whether you come see us or not. Um, we have secondary applications that are specific to a region or a condition. Um, two of them that I, that I highlighted in uh, in one of my slides is around a health works program that we do for um, employer groups. Uh, that does diet, nutrition, as well as exercise and, um, and activity logging. Um, we're starting to look at some of the preventative um, type applications, whether they're around uh, condition tracking or weight loss and things like that. So we're also looking at what's on the market that we could either reuse or speak to or perhaps recommend um, versus having to build it ourselves. We don't want to build everything ourselves. It's, it's too costly. It's too, too, time, too time consuming. There's other applications out there that do it a lot better. So we try to look to take advantage of that. So it's part of that suite that we want to um, offer as a, as a provider out to our members, knowing that they will use ours and they might end up using another. I think it's what you were getting at, that, that data integration of if you're using a different one, can we get access to that and bring it into part of, to part of your activity and part of your record? So. Yeah, that, to tag on to, what, to um, what they said at Kaiser is, this, is the same kind of situation. We use a service-oriented architecture. Um, it really is a curation of a care plan. So if you can write a care plan for it, you can manage it. And when you look at chronic disease, uh, most of the, of the standard of care is around health and well-being, maintaining your weight, maintaining a healthy lifestyle, exercising, quitting smoking, stopping drinking, those things that, that are uh, synonymous with health and well-being. So it cuts across the whole continuum. Health and well-being is the baseline uh, of the care plan. So, um, uh, you know, chronically ill people get acutely ill a lot more.
frequently, and that's part of the reasons uh, that, that costs go up. So when we started, we wanted to do a couple things really well, and that was help people navigate. Um, really, we call it the three S's when it's a situational problem, uh, if there's a seasonal, uh, you know, prevalence of something, obviously flu and stuff like that, and then storage of, of your medical information. And if we could do those things really well and engage people and grow a population, then we can start offering other high-value things at the same time. Um, Aetna has a, a plan called CarePass uh, that integrates a lot of other mobile technologies and, and apps into um, a platform that allows you to share data back and forth. So we, you know, we're interested in looking at sort of the best of the best solutions out there um, in those spaces and then leveraging, you know, millions of users um, to get eyeballs and access to that, that capability. Fantastic. Thank you. And please, another round of applause for our panel.